I'll start out by using the statement, the kingdom of God is coming. That shouldn't surprise us. After all, is that not the crown jewel that we all are looking forward to achieving one day and obtaining the kingdom of God? When I say kingdom of God, that denotes eternal life. That denotes for us the first fruits to become eternal forever with God the Father and Jesus Christ. A question along with that, will you see the kingdom? Will you be there? Will you and I be there? Today, I want to give the answer to that question. Those who will inherit the kingdom. And sad to say, at the end of the sermon, speak a little bit from scripture about those who will not be there. It's a very sobering type sermon today. As I look forward to soon with all of you, looking forward to observing the last piece of the journey, so to speak, of the fall holy days that are soon to be upon us. It's a message today that is very sobering in one sense, but one that we all need to really take heart from and consider the things that will be said. It's a back to the basics, as I've been given. The subject matter is as basic as can be given to the scriptures. And that subject that I speak of today is repentance, repentance, repentance. You don't get more basic than that. Because repentance is the way to the kingdom. Again, as I've been using those two terms recently with legacy and destiny, just kind of intertwining that again today, repentance rec represents the legacy that we leave. And the destiny represents the kingdom that we will obtain. And repentance is the way to get there. Repentance is that journey. Repentance is that pilgrimage that we are making to get to the kingdom of God one day. Your title for the sermon today, you can jot it down if you take notes. The title is, Is It Repentance or Remorse? Is it repentance with us or remorse? In a very frank and close examination today, Using these two words interchangeably much as I will. Repentance and remorse. The difference can be all the difference. And yet remorse and repentance as well are tied together. And I will go through some of these things today. And explain in more detail in a type of a examination sermon. Because this sermon as all really are. This sermon is, again, more of a type of self-examination, not only individually, but we as a church. Because as I told somebody last week in Birmingham or Fulton, I said, after all, the ultimate preparation for us all is to become that perfect, holy, unblemished bride of Jesus Christ. To one day inherit that kingdom and to be by his side for all eternity. So the whole essence is to prepare our lives now to be there with Christ when he returns to be that bride. And that's what I feel like that the mission of the church right now in 2022 is more than ever should be about that is preparing the bride. And I believe that ministry, and especially pastoral ministry, that our chief mission should be to continue to prepare you the bride and when I say you the bride, me included, that we prepare the bride for Jesus Christ. Turn in your Bibles. And I need to get my glasses. It's funny, I had forgotten to get my glasses. I call these my cheaters as I've gotten older. Give them a little wipe down. I have some smudges on them. Turn to Mark chapter 1. You can be turning there. Mark chapter 1. The gospel. And I'll get there in a moment with you. Mark chapter 1. 
Oh, how familiar these verses are in chapter four, 1 of Mark, verse 14 and 15. After John was put in the prison, that is John the Baptist, Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So Jesus Christ, with the inception of his own ministry, following suit of John the Baptist's ministry, preached a message of repentance, and that the kingdom of God is near. And for certainly each of us here today, those of us in the modern age of the church, those in every age of the church that have been first fruits, the time has always been imminent for a first fruit. A first fruit of any age, including us today, the time is imminent in front of us to prepare our lives now. Through repentance, which is to change our lives now. Because it is through the change that we will incur and go through that is to prepare us to receive that kingdom. And so these are things that I will talk about. So we see Jesus Christ very clearly here talking about repentance and to repent. So the question always with us, as we examine ourselves, we do this individually. And this is an individual exam today. For those of you here listening, those listening by webcast today, those who will hear this later, delayed, those who will hear it on the website when it's put up, the question remains for us all, each one of us, are we truly repenting? Are we truly becoming repentant creatures, new creations in the hand of Jesus Christ and the Father? Or is it simply what I would call, and I didn't coin the term, fake repentance? Is it only remorse? Is it only remorse? In other words, do our own feelings, our own emotions at times, deceive us into telling us that we have repented? Maybe of a specific sin or problem that we've been grappling with for a long time? Something in our nature? Something of an overt manner that we are engaged in and we know it's wrong? And we know we're transgressing and we're sorry for it and we regret it every time we do it. But do we stop doing it? Do we begin to make changes? Do we begin to amend it? And so our emotions and our feelings can tell us at times that we're really trying to be repentant when those feelings and emotions can lie to us. The question could be asked in the moment, can your feelings and emotions lie to you? They sure can. Have my feelings and emotions lied to me at times in my life? Absolutely. So is it real repentance or only remorse in the moment? Only sorrow in the moment? Only regret in the moment? The word for repentance in the Strong's, used mostly in the New Testament, simply means to think differently or afterwards to reconsider to feel compunction. And then that word compunction means a feeling of guilt or moral scruple that prevents or follows the doing of something bad. Guilt, regret. I think almost all of us do know when we transgress or commit a wrong or we may say the wrong thing, we may do the wrong thing, we may be even sad to say, and bluntly speaking, we may be sometimes even being too cozy with some sin or practice of sin or transgression. And it's being difficult to repent of that. And we're sorry for it. And each time that maybe we commit that same sin or that problem, indiscretion, word spoken, out of order, action, you name it. Most of us feel a certain sense of regret, sorrow, guilt, shame that we did it again. I did it again. What about your temper? Nobody in this room or listening has a temper, right? Moses was denied going into the promised land because he lost his temper once too many times and dishonored God. He let his feelings get out of control. And he struck the rock in anger twice when he was told to simply speak to it for the water to come out. Did his temper get the best of him? Got the best of him in Egypt when he slew the tax master? Got the best of him when he slammed the commandments and broke them when he saw what was going on in Israel? Do you think Moses was sorrowful each time he did those things? 
How many times do we tell ourselves we're going to be more patient? We may say, I don't have the proper patience. I lose my patience. I don't have patience. Lord, I want patience and give it to me now. I mean, think about these things in our nature. It's in the Gospels. I don't need to go there. I can paraphrase and quote from it where Christ says it's those things that come out of a person. It's those things that lodge inside of us, that come out of us, that contaminate. I hope that we really understand that. It is not that, as he said, that necessarily goes into you. That contain, It's that which comes out of us, that emanates from the soul of man, that comes out of us. And there's nothing worse than those things of the human nature that come out of us, spill out of us. That keep contaminating our life and even contaminates the life of those around us at times. When you say things to hurt people and you say, I did it again. I didn't mean to say such a thing to hurt anyone. And I did it again. I'm so sorry. But when's the next time you do it again? I did something. I did that same thing. I committed that same transgression, that sin. And I was, I thought I had a handle on that. I'm sorry. I'm remorseful. I feel guilt. I feel shame. But have I done anything in real terms to really change it? And before I go further today, the first step of repentance is remorse. And that's how remorse ties into repentance. Remorse is that first step toward becoming repentant and repenting. Because you first have to have that sense of guilt, shame, sorrow, in order to know that you need to change that which has been, can we say, tripping you up. Answer it in your mind. What trips you up the most? Examine your nature in the moment. Examine who you are inside because this sermon is again a message for each one of us to fill the blanks in as individuals. What is it that trips me up the most still? I know what it is. What trips you up the most? What is it that you wage the greatest battle with that still lodge too deep in your nature that's a part of that carnality that just doesn't want to yet give up the fight? It's in us all. You have remorse, which is that initial step each time that you fail, you fall down, so to speak. And you have that shame, guilt, sorrow, what have you. But does it move you toward the actual state of repentance, which is change, to stop doing it? Because that's what repentance represents. It represents looking it in the eye and moving forward to stop it, to stop doing that. And to begin to change it and move it in a direction of a godly thought and pattern of action. I have a Thayer's Greek English lexicon, which simply is a Greek lexicon. goes into more detail of all the words, you know, that's in the New Testament written in the Greek manuscripts. And the Thayer's Greek English lexicon says about the word repentance... The change of mind of those who have begun to abhor their errors and misdeeds and have determined to enter upon a better course of life so that it embraces both a recognition of sin and sorrow for it and hearty amendment, the tokens and effects of which are good deeds. So to simplify that definition simply means that to repent, to have repentance happen means to not only have the guilt, regret, sorrow, guilt, shame for those things that we commit, but to recognize it and to begin to make amends for that, offerings to God as you would. Brethren, do we ever stop to think that our the things that God is doing in us, and notice I said God is doing in us, because there is no righteousness apart from God in Christ. There is nothing that you can do in forms of a righteous deed unless God and Christ are living in you. And so therefore, as they live in us and those righteous deeds represented by them in us, as we do those things, then that offers up pleasant offerings like sweet aroma to God in Christ, as the scriptures tell us. This is what repentance is. I've given many messages in Many, many, many years and how many messages I've talked at times about repentance. And yet today I try to bring it in to an even sharper focus. 
It's like, what can I do to drive this essence of repentance home even greater in our minds? And so this is why I'm giving this sermon today, trying to drive into our minds and hearts this greater essence of what repentance looks like. Because there's no greater subject from the Bible that we need to have familiarity with than when Christ said repent, and that was the message of John the Baptist. It was the message of prophets. It will be the message of the prophets when they come again will be to repent. Except this time, the prophets that are going to come one day are going to go before the nations. And they're going to go before nations. And they're going to tell nations of the earth, especially the house of Jacob, to repent. And that time's coming. Remorse is the beginning of repentance. That initial guilt, regret, sorrow has to happen. And there are those as well, which is a very sad state, there are those who sin who have no remorse. That's another category. There are those who have such hardened hearts now that sin constantly transgress and they have no remorse. That is another category. Would you say much of the world right now? Would you say many of our leaders of the world, including this United States of America, are sinning and transgressing with no remorse? There are more and more of our leaders nationally that are becoming harder and harder of heart, like Pharaoh. When God said, let my people go, and the more, the more plagues were poured out, the harder his heart became. We're seeing that play out today. As we are nearing, and we are now headed down toward the ultimate climax of man's time on earth, his history of nearly 6,000 years, of where man has followed his way. And so, only to those of repentant hearts and minds are going to ultimately be salvaged. Repentance, a remorse, as we look at our lives, and we look at our lives very closely, I think sometimes we we do, so much of the time when we come to Passover each year, we come to Passover each year and we know, okay, this is the annual observance of Passover, days of unleavened bread to follow, and we're told, and we focus on getting that leaven out, examining our life, and we kind of go through that Passover, seven days of unleavened bread, and when it's over, well, we got the leaven out, we bring the leaven back in, and I think sometimes we only focus on that time of the year and not near enough on the rest of the year because the Passover story and lesson is a daily lesson. It, 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 just keeps, it just keeps each day of our life, that Passover lamb, Jesus Christ, whom is that Passover, our Passover, and what he did for us, it is ever more looming before our very eyes. It's always there in front of our consciousness. It should be. And to be examining for that leaven in our life. We, we put the leaven out seven days. We bring it back. And, oh, good. We can have our hamburgers and pizza again. And all that stuff that puffs up. And yet, how often do we just keep looking at those lessons from those seven days every day of our life? Because the lesson is to put the leaven out every day still. And as I've come to understand so much more thoroughly over the years... The days are called the days of unleavened bread. Why are they called the days of unleavened bread? It's obvious. We are to put on that unleavened portion. We are to put inside more and more of that unleavened portion, which is Jesus Christ. And if that is happening, then the leaven is being eradicated and put out. All of this is synonymous with repentance. But can I speak Southern? If it ain't happening, then all you've got is remorse in the moment and there's no action behind it. I'll invoke my beloved Aunt Evelina and her famous statement, God don't bless nothing. That was one of her favorite little sayings. God don't bless nothing. And he doesn't. God bless his effort. He bless his effort. You want to make your million dollars? You got to go out and work for it, Right. You don't sit in your home watching TV all day and say, well, I missed that first million, so I'm going to start on the second one. That was kind of a popular saying when I grew up. Well, I'd hear people sometimes, well, I didn't make my first million, so now I'm going to work on my second one, you know. Static, stuck in neutral, does none of us no good. Remorse is that first step to repentance. Again, we have to feel that sense of shame and guilt. 
Where is the greatest sense of shame and guilt? And what should be the greatest motivating factor for that shame and guilt when we sin, transgress, mess up? Real quick, go to Psalms 51. It was not in my sermon notes. It came to me in the moment. Psalms 51, David, King David's prayer of repentance. Psalms 51, David's prayer of repentance recorded after the sins with the set up murder of Uriah, the adultery of Bathsheba. And he expressly in this Psalms expresses his inward being at his sin. And I want to point something out here. If you look at verse 3, for I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Notice this, against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Words, my sin is against you, O God. Every sin, every transgression is ultimately the affront before God. And so if we have remorse and grief and regret over sins that we commit and transgressions, then if we're carrying within us the heart of David, why he was a man after God's heart, because his heart was attuned to God and repenting of what he had done. And you don't find where David repeated his sins. I don't see anywhere in scripture where David repeated his sins. He never numbered Israel again. He never was recorded to have committed adultery again. He was never recorded to have planned a murder again. David repented. And that's why he was a man after God's heart. That's it. He was quick to change and change for good and change for real. And he had remorse. And this expresses, that prayer expresses his remorse and his guilt and his shame. But he turns that all into a productive effort to truly repent and change his life as he did. And that's what repentance looks like, a changed life. A changed life of where, where you were yesterday. And we all, I hope, are seeking to do that, to have changed lives. Remorse can look like repentance again. And how many times have we done something and we're habitual? Let's, let's just be honest in our minds and hearts. I ask you, what trips you up the most? What is it in your nature? What is it that you seem to grapple with the most? And you know what that is. I hope you do. I know what mine is. It's what Paul says in Romans 7. Again, always coming back to Paul in Romans 7. He said, those things I want to do, I don't always do. And the things I don't want to do, well, that's what I do. This is what Paul's talking about, the struggle. And it's the struggle we're all in. It's the struggle to have God and his way have mastery over the human way and the carnality that lives in us all. And brethren, it lives in us all. We're never going to be turned out. We're never going to be completely turned out until we breathe our last and Christ comes back and we are raised and then, and then we are turned out because we are raised then to meet him and become immortal and to live and dwell with he for eternity as his bride to be. The consequences for Things we do, and you can take that, that little expression to the outer limits of our life. Again, we know, I mean, you live daily. I live daily. We live daily. We know, do we not each know each day what we struggle with the most? What is it there again that we seem to find in our life that trips us up, that we want to do that good, but we fail I'm not going to lose my temper like that again. I'm not going to show that kind of impatience again. I'm never going to say those kind of hard words to someone again. And I did it again. And I did it again. And it's just repetitive. But when does it stop? When do we look at it and say enough is enough? I knew a man from history. I knew a man from history that, that I knew of from history that was severely alcoholic. He would go into every bar. And back in that day and age, they kept a record of how much whiskey a man could consume and walk out on his feet. And he was notorious for his whiskey drinking. And he goes in there and said, what's the house record? They told him. It amounted to close to a gallon of whiskey. 
And he drank what amounted to almost a gallon of whiskey and he walked out. But he said, that will be it. And he gave it up and never went back to the whiskey again. That man was John L. Sullivan, the first heavyweight champion of the world. You see people, and I've known people, and you have, and they've had this problem. And they look at that problem in the eye, and they say, no more. And I've known them. I've known them personally. And they stopped it and never looked back, and they changed their life. And you and I have known people who have regret over and over and over and sorrow and shame and guilt and regret for what they do, but they just keep doing it over and over. That's not repentance. Repentance changes that which has caused the sorrow and the grief. Repentance will move beyond the, the regret and the shame and the sorrow of that transgression. And there's a cleansing that takes place. A cleansing begins to take place. Remorse, you might say, stops short of making permanent adjustments. Remorse is that initial step that needs to be in place to feel that shame. David felt the shame and the guilt and the sorrow of what he had done with the adultery and the cover-up and the planned murder. He must have felt terrible, abhorred himself. But he did not live in that state. He did not remain in that state of just remorse. He changed his life and he repented and he never repeated those things again. I got a speeding ticket. Yeah, in the past. You probably have too, so don't feel self-righteous sitting out there. You probably have too. In fact, I got more than one speeding ticket in the past. I didn't tell you how far back in the past. We've all probably, if you've driven long enough, you probably have got either you've got a speeding ticket or you have passed on a double yellow or you name it. Well, what are you sorry for? Are you sorry for the ticket and the fine and your pocketbook's a little bit lighter? Is that what you're remorseful over? Or are you really remorseful that you broke the law? And I have to confess that we get a speeding ticket. We broke the law. Are we only remorseful for getting caught? See, you can apply that across the board to so many situations. The thief that gets caught and he's got regret, shame or whatever. Is it really repentance or the fact that he just got caught? And he's going as soon as he can go back and steal again. I know that you are processing what I'm saying. I can say I'm sorry many times. I can say I'm sorry all day long, as the old cliche would go. And yet if I'm doing nothing about that which caused that initial grief, sorrow, shame, then I'm just remaining in a, you might say, a very stationary frame of mind and letting that sin, transgression control me. You see, repentance moves beyond control I should say repentance moves beyond that problem, sin, controlling you. Repentance turns loose of that which has held you in bondage. And it moves you into spiritual territory of God's righteousness. Ultimately, repentance is that essence that is going to move us in a very positive direction. Remorse without repentance to follow will just keep you living in the shame and the regret and the sorrow. I've lived my life, and I personally simply say that in a very big extended family that I grew up in, I grew up in a very big extended family. And back from where I come from, in fact, uh, my cousin, Mac McAnally from Belmont, famous songwriter, has that song, Back Where I Came From, speaking of his hometown of Belmont. So back where I came from, I have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of relatives everywhere. And I've known many of them. And I've known many addictions among many people. Among relatives, 
among the church in my lifetime, perhaps no remorse is greater than the addict who lives in that, in that stationary life of sin, regret, shame, sorrow over the addiction, and how many times they loathe themselves, regret what they're doing, and every time they turn to that addiction, they abhor themselves that much more, the shame that comes with it, the sorrow, the grief, the sadness. But how many times the addict never does anything beyond the sorrow of the moment to repent of that addiction. And it just becomes this vicious cycle. And that cycle that ultimately destroys all addicts if they don't repent of it. Because I've seen far too many lives in bondage to addictions in my lifetime in the church and in my own immediate family and extended family. They destroyed themselves through those addictions. It's a very sad thing. There's two classic examples that I want to use in the time I have left today in the Bible. Two classic examples of was it repentance or was it remorse only? The first one is in the Old Testament. Turn to Genesis 25. Genesis chapter 25. And I think many of you know exactly who I'm going to and who we're going to use as a poster child for this subject today. Genesis 25. We'll start in verse 29. We come to this stage of Jacob and Esau, two brothers, and we just simply pick the story up here, verse 29, Genesis 25, and Jacob cooked a stew, and Esau came in from the field and was very weary. And Esau said to Jacob, please feed me with that same red stew, for I am weary. And therefore his name was called Edom. But Jacob said, sell me your birthright as of this day. In other words, if you'll give me your birthright, sell it to me. I will give you this bowl of soup. And Esau said, look, I am about to die. So what profit shall this birthright be to me? And Jacob said, swear to me as of this day. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau bread and stew of lentils. And then he ate and drank, arose and went his way. And thus Esau despised his birthright. From the Hebrew simply means considered it in a worthless sense to him. In that sense, it was worthless to him to sell a birthright for a meal, for a bowl of soup. Probably had some meat in it. But he despised that which he never had any real, you might say, affinity for. And we see that here with Esau. I want you to go now to chapter 27 and just reference to chapter 27 because in chapter 27, we pick the story up without going through all the story about how Jacob, encouraged by his mother, Rebekah, has dressed up in the skins, you know, the goat skins, what have you, because Esau was a very hairy man. And so Jacob, encouraged by his mother, Rebekah, encouraged him to go to Isaac, your father, dress up like Esau, and take the blessing, say, receive the blessing from your father, from my husband, Isaac. And so we see that Jacob commits this type of a treachery, and he goes and deceives his father to get the blessing. I want to point out something in the moment. The blessing was going to be Jacob's to start with. It was promised to Jacob before the boys were born. They were twins. And Esau was the firstborn. These two boys in the womb were warring so fiercely against one another in the womb of Rebekah. That Rebecca goes to God and she inquires of God, what is going on in my womb? Because there was such a war going on among these two brothers in her womb. What is going on? And God tells her, you have two nations in your womb and the elder, older will serve the younger. So the blessing was to be Jacob's all the time. 
there didn't have to be this type of deceit and treachery practiced because God doesn't break his promise. And yet Jacob did it the wrong way. And of course, under encouragement from his mother. And by the way, Josephus, the Jewish historian, records that Jacob was like his father Isaac in the sense that he was a quieter man of nature, but he had his mother's deceitful nature. And so if you've read about Jacob before he became converted, he, Jacob, used his wits, wits to get the best of anybody. If you got a, if you entered into a deal with Jacob, he got the best of you. And so that's just kind of a little sideline to the whole story. By the way, the word Jacob means supplanter, supplanter. The scripture is clear. When the boys were born and Esau was born first, Jacob literally actually had a hole of Esau's foot. And that word Jacob means supplanter. And that's what he did. He supplanted Esau as God had said he would. And then later, when he was given the name Israel on the night that he wrestled all night, he had a new name given to him of Israel, which I have covered in the past in those sermons. And he became a changed vessel. He became a repentant vessel. And no doubt, look back on some things he had done with remorse and regret. That's why it's called Jacob's trouble, because Jacob had a lot of troubles. You have two wives and a bunch of basically concubines producing children in a race to produce more children. You got problems. Jacob had a lot of problems. Hey, I hope this will encourage you to all of you go back if you haven't read the story of Jacob to go back and read the whole story. Jacob's story from start to finish is one of the most fascinating stories of scripture. All right, so we're back in Genesis here. This has happened. So now if you're looking at chapter 27, drop down to verse 30. So Jacob is gone and by deceit wrestled the blessing, you might say, away from Esau. Even though, like I said, God had always intended to go to Jacob and he didn't have to do it that way. So we come to verse 30 in chapter 27. It happened as soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob and Jacob had scarcely gone. He'd barely gone from the presence of Isaac, his father, that Esau, his brother, came in from his hunting. He also had made savory food and brought it to his father and said to his father, let my father arise and eat of this son's game that your soul may bless me. And his father Isaac said to him, who are you? And he said, I am your son, your firstborn Esau. And Isaac trembled exceedingly. I'm reading from the New King James Version. In other words, Isaac was very upset because he knew now something's not right here. There's been some type of deception here. And he said, who? Where is the one who hunted game and brought it to me? Because Jacob had dressed up like he was Esau and deceived his father. And Isaac's waking up and realizing this. He says, I ate all of it before you came and I have blessed him. And indeed he shall be blessed. And Esau heard the words, verse 34, of his father. He cried with an exceedingly great and bitter cry. And he said to his father, bless me, even me also, O my father. But he said, your brother came with deceit. And has taken away your blessing. And Esau said, is he not rightfully named Jacob? There's that word Jacob. What does it mean? Supplanter. He has again supplanted me. He took my birthright. Now he's taken my blessing. He has supplanted me these two times. For he has supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright. And now look, he has taken away my blessing. And he said, have you not reserved a blessing for me? And Isaac answered and said to Esau, indeed, I have made him your master. And all of his brethren I have given to him as servants. With grain and wine I have sustained him. What shall I do now for you, my son? And Esau said to his father, Have you only one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, O my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and he wept. And Esau was very repentant. Was he? Or just remorse regret in the moment that he had squandered his birthright, sold it so cheaply, and then the blessing was gone. Was he truly repentant or just remorseful in the moment? I'll give you a big hint. Jot down Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12, verse 16 and 17. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 16 and 17. 
the writer of Hebrews, whether it's the Apostle Paul or Apollos or Luke the physician, whoever wrote Hebrews, doesn't matter, inspired word of God, we find here, verse 16, breaking right into the heart of the matter, lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright, for you know that afterward when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. Is there a contradiction of scripture here? Did he seek true repentance? Was he truly repentant? Was there something in Esau's life from that day forward that changed? Not hardly. He was sorry in the moment. He was thinking totally of himself. Nothing in terms of how his life, even up to that time, had been an affront before God. Because Esau was to say the least, not a spiritual man. We also find that word profane. I don't know, many years ago, doing Bible study, I wanted to know, well, what, what does that word profane mean? So I went back to the Greek word there for the word profane, and the simplest definition that I can give you for what it means to be profane. If you say, well, so-and-so is a profane person. The simplest meaning and the most comprehensive and best way I can phrase it is, does not care for the things of God. Esau did not care for the things of God. And if you know the life of Esau, and you know his whole history, Esau never changed his life. Yes, he was sorry in the moment that he sold his birthright for a bowl of soup. And he wept in the moment because the blessing was wrested from him from Jacob. Although, again, it was never intended to to Esau from the start and never would have because God doesn't break his promise and God doesn't lie. And he had told Rebekah from the start when they were in the womb that the elder will serve the younger. And thus it has been and always shall be. In essence, Jacob was elevated to firstborn status. There was no place for repentance with Esau because Esau was a person that lived in the moment. Esau was a man that lived to placate the senses. That's why he was willing to sell his birthright for a one meal, one moment in time. And then the consequences after which caused him sorrow, regret, but not enough sorrow regret, which again is the initial step to repentance. But it never moved beyond that state of being remorseful to do something about his life because Esau never changed his life because he was a profane man. He did not care for the things of God. Jacob cared for the things of God and his legacy, his life proved it. And it's recorded in scripture. The other example I won't use from the Bible of repentance or remorse. Was it repentance or remorse? It's in the New Testament. And there's no better illustration to use this as a story. Was it repentance or was it remorse only? Judas. Go to Matthew 27. Matthew 27. Starting in verse 1. Matthew 27, verse 1. When morning came, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to uh, Pontius Pilate, the governor. And Judas, his betrayer, seeing that he had been condemned, was remorseful and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? You see to it. So verse five, he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went out and hanged himself. He went out and hanged himself. That word repent in that instance of scripture there in the gospel of Matthew, that word for repentance is only used five times in the New Testament. And the Greek word for that word repentance in that particular case there of Judas 
simply means to be overwhelmed with emotion. Of course, Judas was overwhelmed with emotion because he realized that he had betrayed Jesus Christ. And the emotion was too great for the moment for him. And he had that initial regret, sorrow, sadness, regret, all of that. It was there in place. But what's, what's the key element to tell us, was he really repentant or just remorseful, overwhelmed with emotion? Well, repentant people don't commit murder. Repentant people don't commit suicide. That tells you there. And if you think, I'm just saying this, check me out on all the theologians and scholars. They know exactly. He was overwhelmed with emotion, remorse in the moment. But instead of dedicating his life from that point on to the serving Jesus Christ and correcting things till he died, he chose the easy way out. Overwhelmed with emotion, he chose to commit suicide. When Peter was rebuked, when Peter denied Christ the third time that night, and he realized what he had done, Peter goes out too and weeps bitterly. Very remorseful. But what did Peter do with his life? When Christ looked at him later and said, Do you love me? Feed my sheep. Tend my sheep. Do you love me, Peter? You know I do. Peter demonstrated true repentance, but doing what? Moving beyond remorse, regret, sorrow, and changing. That's the difference in true repentance. True repentance moves beyond just being sorry and begins to stop the problem in its tracks, begins to change, alter, make amendments, produce works, deeds, actions that are of a spiritual nature. That's what repentance represents. Give you a few quick sayings. I wrote these down. Some of them came from the internet. Two or three I kind of came up with, but I want to share with you. There's a difference between remorse and repentance. Remorse is being sorry for being caught. Repentance is being sorry enough to stop. Again, do we have the initial remorse cause? I got caught. I got trapped again. I did it again. I sinned again. I want to do better. Tomorrow, well, that's what Scarlett said, right? Right, Natalie? Tomorrow is another day. I will do better tomorrow. Tomorrow comes. I do as bad today or worse than yesterday. And another day comes, another week, another month, another year. And what am I doing? I'm stuck in this same old cycle, this same old addictive pattern, habitual pattern. I keep falling down and I never change the problem. I never get out of the problem. Another one. I regret is not an apology, nor is it repentance. To repent is to own the offense, confess it, and to turn from it and be forgiven. That came from a Jack Graham that was off the internet that I found that I really did love. I wrote one of my own. I wrote, repentance finishes what remorse started. Sorrow that leads to change. That's what repentance is. It takes the remorse in the moment and moves it to a positive direction of change, repentance. This was a good one that I found on the internet. Repentance is a U-turn to God. Notice that, a U-turn to God. That means if you're doing a U-turn, you know you're using your GPS. We did that yesterday. And you know how the GPS will do you? Make a U-turn. I can't make a U-turn here. I'm talking to the woman, you know. It's just a artificial intelligence person, I guess. Like yesterday. Where do you want me to turn? You know, it's bad when you talk to your GPS, you know. But you know how to do. Make a U-turn. Make a U-turn. But repentance is a U-turn to God. Remorse without repentance keeps you in the problem. Remorse that produces repentance removes the problem. Finally, remorse is a false guilt. Deceiving the offender and never owning the offense by changing or stopping it. And repentance restores, corrects the problem, Remorse remains static, guilty with no results. If we only stay remorseful and don't truly repent, then there are no results. I want you to go now 
to 2 Corinthians 7. 2 Corinthians 7. The Apostle Paul here. Second Corinthians 7. I'm going to break right into his letter here. Verse 8. Second Corinthians chapter 7, verse 8. Paul says, For even if I made you sorry with my letter, that letter, that strong letter that he wrote to the church there in Corinth, I do not regret it, though I did regret it, for I received, perceived that the same epistle made you sorry, though only for a while. Notice that. Only for a while. You were sorry. But it didn't last. That's what Paul is saying. Now rejoice not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow did what? Led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance to salvation. Not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. What Paul is saying is true remorse that leads to repentance delivers you into life, ultimately, and life evermore. But those who do not repent and do not let that remorse, that initial phase of repentance, when they don't let that initial remorse move them to change their life, to change the problem, to get out of the problem, to stop the transgression, stop the sin, then ultimately death occurs. Paul's not addressing the first death. He's addressing the second death. This is serious business. Go to Luke 13. Luke 13. Christ now begins to address it square on. Luke 13. Starting in verse 22. And he went through the cities and villages teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. And then one said to him, Lord, are there few who are saved? And he said to them, Strive to enter the, through the narrow gate for many. Notice this. For many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able. When once the master of the house has risen up and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and knock at the door saying, Lord, Lord, open for us. And he will answer and say to you, I do not know you where you are from. And then you will begin to say, well, we ate and drank in your presence. And you taught us, you taught in our streets, but he will say, I tell you, I do not know you where you are from. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. Verse 28, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and yourselves thrust out. Brethren, what are you going to make of that other than what you see? Jesus Christ's very words gives the answer Many will be cast out. There's no doubt about it. Many will not receive it. Christ's own words. And there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. They will come from the east and the west, from the north and the south, and sit down in the kingdom of God. And those who are weeping and gnashing their teeth will see what they could have had. They will have sold their spiritual birthright for this life, for this world. And for the things of this world. And they're cast out forever. This is what Christ is saying brethren. Go to the book of Revelation. Revelation 21. Revelation 21. This is the most serious business. That we can ever be involved in. And that is the business of salvation. Repentance. As Christ said at 12 years of age. In the temple that day. Teaching those scribes and Pharisees and all those he was teaching. Verse 49 of Luke 2 when he said, I must be about my father's business. And that business centers around repentance. Changing one's life that one may receive the ultimate goal of eternal life. We're here in Revelation 21. I always go. I never do a funeral. A memorial service, celebration of life. I don't think I've ever done a, a funeral celebration of life memorial without going and reading these verses from Revelation 21. Those first six verses especially that tell us the beauty of what will come one day when there will be no more sorrow, no more death, no more crying. That beautiful time coming one day of New Jerusalem and when God himself will come down and dwell in New Jerusalem 
with his family. So I never do a service without ultimately at the end coming here. But I never go past that because it's not the time to do so. But with us, the church, the first fruits, and being called now, and judgment upon us now, and when I just read Christ's words in Luke 13, then I come to us, verse 7. He who overcomes, and this is the words of Christ to John. These were the words of Christ to John. Christ the revelator. He's the revelator of the book of Revelation. He's the one that says, John, write it down. And Christ says here, he who overcomes shall inherit all things. And I will be his God, and he shall be my son. And then verse 8. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, the sexually immoral, the sorcerers, the idolaters, all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. This is a carry forth from what Christ said there in the gospel of Luke that Luke recorded of when Christ on earth, doing his ministry on earth, alluded to the time that there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth from many who will be cast out. Because they simply, as I've given in messages leading up to today, because they did not love God, as I brought out the last time here with all of you then. God will throw no one into the lake of fire. He will put no one to the second death unless they have had full opportunity and recognition of salvation set before them. We don't, we never have, we never will, at least I never will, teach universal salvation. We've been accused as a church for decades of teaching by some universal salvation that all will be saved. You don't see that from what Christ says. He clearly says many will be thrust out and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth because just as Esau wept bitterly because he had sold his birthright for a what? A bowl of soup. And they will weep and gnash their teeth as they will have been given opportunity to repent and change their life. And they would not do it. And they're having this ultimate great remorse in the moment. The greatest remorse, time of remorse that will ever happen and is recorded in scripture. There will never ever be such a time of remorse in the moment of weeping and crying and nasty when they see that their life is about to be snuffed out for eternity because they were not willing to do that, which God had asked them to do to change their life, to repent, to move their life beyond remorse of the moment to have actual change happen. Brethren, repentance will be on the authority of God's word and knowing all the places I could go to. The coming message that is coming by the prophets when they show up is going to center around repentance. And they're going to go before nations. And I have no doubt they will go before this nation and England and France and the modern sons of Jacob when that time comes. And they will be warned. And that message will be to repent. We now are having our time. We're having our time, as Peter says in his letter, our time of judgment is now. Our time to change our life is now. All of us, all of us fail at times. We all do. We all, that old word we like to use, we mess up. We have problems that we fight and grapple with. But it's those who are in the fight. That's kind of like my little saying, pet saying that I have. If you're in the fight, if you're in the game, and you're striving to overcome, then God's going to be with you in that overcoming process. But it's only those who never move beyond the moment, never move beyond the moment of transgression and sin to actually begin to change it, to stop it. It's only then that we now are getting into very dangerous territory. Hopefully we will all consider these things and continue to understand and realize that the kingdom is coming. It is before us, and we are now looking forward to inheriting that kingdom one day. So I'll leave you with a question again. In our own personal lives, each day, as we grapple and war and fight against this self that is in us all, this carnality, the world that's coming at us, the culture, Satan himself, 
Is it repentance or is it remorse? 